All right, I think this looks pretty good, so we can get started. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure today to welcome Abhishek Maniyar um, to give our uh, lunch seminar. So, Abhishek is a postdoc at NYU, um, but he uh, told me that he will be uh, starting later this year a um, fellowship position at KIPAC at Stanford, so he'll be moving to the West Coast. So, hopefully, you'll get to see him in person at some point in the near future. Um, so Abhishek works on a variety of different things, um, but he's uh, particularly uh, today going to talk to us about the cosmic infrared background and how we can use that as a, a signal to actually infer interesting cosmology. So I'll uh, take it away, Abhishek. Thank you. Great. Okay. So let me just continue. Screen out of me. Great. So, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Abhishek Maniar. I'm a postdoc at the uh, Center for Cosmology and Particle Physics of the New York University. And uh, I'm happy to be giving this lunch talk today, uh, although virtually. But uh, as Andrew just mentioned, I would be on the West Coast very, very soon. So I hope to visit in person at some point in your future. And uh, yes, yeah, so today I'll be talking to you about something called the CIB, the cosmic infrared background, and what are all different kinds of things you can do uh, with the CIB. For some people, it's a bad, guy, bad, bad, bad thing. For some people, it's a good thing. And I'm trying to cover, I, I will try to cover all those things today. And uh, I, uh, I, as, uh, I'm aware that uh, at the observatory, there are people doing all kinds of, all different kinds of stuff. So I got a bit excited and included a lot of topics, uh, different topics in the present day. So I apologize if the, if, if, if the uh, presentation or if the talk is a bit too heavy, but I'll try to be as uh, slow and clear as possible. But please don't hesitate to stop me in between if something is not clear and if I could clarify things. Uh, all right, with that being said, I wanna start. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to cover a lot of different topics. So I think I would like to st start a bit slow uh, and cover what are the different uh, phases of our history of our universe I'm going to touch upon. That's why I'm going to start with a brief history of our universe. I'm sure most of you have seen this plot several times in your lives, uh, but just bear with me for a, one, uh, a minute or so. So I explain that what, what's happening here again so that we all of us are on the same page. So this is a bit rough timeline of the history of our universe. Universe started, we, we believe, with, a, with, with an inflationary phase. And then there was this hot plasma where the, where the particles and the light uh, were very uh, closely, uh, tightly uh, coupled to each other. And the light could not escape. But eventually, the universe cooled down enough such that the light uh, uh, the light and the particles could decouple and the light could propagate. And that's what we see as the cosmic microwave background uh, in the millimeter, some millimeter ranges of the sky. And then after that, there was a big period of something called the dark ages where nothing really crazy happened. The years kept on expanding, the matter particles, they kept on falling into the potential wells created by the dark matter. Uh, and nothing really uh, crazy happened in this period. And then there was something called the reionization period when the first stars and galaxies started to form, and uh, uh, these uh, these first uh, these first sources started to ionize. They started to emit photons, which started to ionize the neutral hydrogen medium around them, and this is called the period of reionization, where universe is getting reionized again, uh, ionized again, and once once this period of reionization finished, then we entered something called the uh, era of galaxy evolution, where you know all these first galaxies and stars which formed, they they kept on evolving, merging. Different processes kept on happening in between, uh, inside of them and outside uh, outside of them, and this phase is still going on. So galaxies are still evolving, and uh, the star formation processes inside of the galaxies are still evolving, and. Overlapping with this phase, we also have the phase of the accelerated expansion of the universe, which is uh, which is caused by uh, by by different uh, by some some cosmological param parameter which uh, which some some of uh, some of us like to call the dark energy or the cosmological constant. Uh, all right, so 
there are different things in all these phases of the uh, of the history of the universe which which we don't really understand very well for example in reionization we are not very sure of the exact redshift and the duration of when reionization started when it ended uh, how 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 it uh, how far uh, how fast it accelerated etc and what what kind of effects it can leave on the cmb and other observables then uh, in the galaxy evolution uh, phase we 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 are still unsure of the exact star formation history we understand it more or less but the, there are some minuscule details which we still don't understand uh, how the galaxies are clustered there is still a lot of research going on on that how different types of galaxy clusters are they de dependent on their environment etc and then how are they related how uh, to their host dark matter halos how are their properties related to the mass of their host dark matter halos that's another question and then as i said in the latest phase of the accelerated expansion we believe it is caused by the dark energy what are the what are its effects on the cmb can we detect it can we what kind of constraints we can put on it so there are all these different kinds of problems and in, in order to study them we need some cosmological tools right then of course the first of all our one of the best cosmological tools we have is the cosmic microwave background but i'm going to argue that there is another tool which i use uh, to connect all these phases uh, which are at completely different redshifts uh, very far from each other and that is the cosmic infrared background so for example in the galaxy evolution phase uh, cosmic infrared back background can act as a tracer of something called dsfgs so those are dusty star forming galaxies that's what i will talk about initially in my talk and then uh, i'll uh, i'll show that this cib is uh, can trace the large scale structure of the universe and so it can be used as a cosmological tool to get uh, to understand uh, different cosmological parameters which drive which drive the dynamics of the universe and then we have I'll, I'll i'll briefly mention uh, how cib can uh, play a role of a foreground so as a nuisance for something uh, something we we would like to know from the era of reionization and i would show that how we can convert that foreground into a signal all right so uh, the word cib appears a lot of times in this slide so let's get started with that first of all the cib is the cosmic infrared background what is the cosmic infrared background so the, uh, wherever there is star formation these so young stars emit a lot of ultraviolet radiation and if the galaxies which are hosting these stars have dust in them this this dust can absorb this ultraviolet radiation and emit it in the infrared and so this and and the cib is formed of this inter infrared radiation so cib is nothing but the cumulative infrared emission of all the galaxies forming stars so uh, probably some of you know there are there are major uh, there there are experiments for example herschel planck uh, which operate in this far infrared uh, millimeter uh, or or the millimeter uh, wavelengths and they they they, uh, they 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 make measurements of the of the sky in this far infrared regime so they measure the cosmic infrared background but unfortunately they can only see the brightest objects individually so for example only 10% of the galaxies which contribute to the cib at 500 microns are detected individually with herschel and even less so with with planck so what happens is we do not see the cib as individual galaxies we, it's the way we see it now it is a diffuse background and so the mean level of this diffuse background of the cib basically tells us what is the overall amount of energy released by the star formation uh, which gets reprocessed by dust in the infrared so that's what the ci uh, mean level of the cib tells us so okay th this is like ba a basic basic theory introduction to the C what cib is but uh, how does it look like so for example if you take an infrared telescope and point it in uh, uh, in, in a particular direction uh, of the sky which is far away from our milky way this is our milky way then you will see something like this uh, so this is how the cib sky looks like at different frequencies now there are different things to notice here uh, first of all we should notice that at different frequency channels that at 
217, 353, 857 gigahertz, for example, the CIB looks slightly different. And not only that, uh, also you should not notice that there are some bright spots here and there, like some anisotropies on this diffuse background. It's not a completely uniform background. There are anisotropies uh, in, in all the frequency channels. So, so what, what's happening here is CIB is emitted by these galaxies, which reside in the dark in, in the dark matter halos, and these galaxies are clustered within this uh, within these halos, and this clustering gives rise to the CIB anisotropies. Wherever there are more galaxies, we have more radiation, so that so an anisotropy appears uh, compared to the mean background, uh, and that's why what what this tells us is CIB anisotropies are basically tracing the large scale distribution of these dusty star forming galaxies, which are which I called DSFGs in my first slide. And these because these DSFGs reside in the dark matter halos, that's why CIB in a way traces the underlying dark matter distribution. So like one of the main messages to take away from here is CIB is an excellent tracer of the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, and that's why this helps us to use CIB anisotropies as a cosmological probe. And CIB anisotropies have another interesting uh, property. Basically, as I told you, pointed out to you before, in different frequencies, the CIB anisotropies and the CIB map itself looks slightly different. Uh, what, what's happening here is CIB has this property that lower CIB at lower frequency, lower frequencies trace galaxies at high redshift to some extent and vice versa. And this gives an unique advantage to the cosmic infrared background radiation that it has, it covers a broad redshift range, basically redshift zero, all the way up to the redshifts where the, the stars are still being formed in the dusty galaxies. So can be seven and higher in fact. Uh, and this, this is a unique advantage, this broad redshift range. And that what that enables us is it can enable us to link the dark matter halos which are hosting these uh, these galaxies with with the star formation at different redshifts. So we can make this very on to uh, to hello uh, connection at different redshifts using the CIB, which is one of the active, most active topics of research nowadays. As our, our galaxy uh, astrophysical data as well as cosmological data keeps on getting better and better. Now that was a brief introduction to the field of CIB. I would like to. Uh, now get started with some of the uh, some of the things we can do with the with the cosmic infrared background. So first of all, I want to uh, say uh, about what we can do on the uh, how we can use the CIB as an astrophysical signal. And basically, when I say CIB, I mean the CIB clustering, uh, see anisotropies of the CIB. Uh, so again, this is how the CIB map looks like. Many of us, if we see such a map with some anisotropies, one of the things we would do is calculate the auto and crossbar spectra of, of these uh, of this, uh, different frequency channels. That's what this shows here. CL is the power spectrum and L is the multi uh, L are the multipoles. And this these are different uh, auto and crossbar spectra of the channels. Now, once we have these measurements, uh, which are the, the power spectra, which are very well measured, we need to model these CIB anisotropies. And uh, first, uh, uh, I, I wanna, the results I'm going to show you right now, they utilize the data only all on the large angular scales. So we don't even have to go to small scales. We can only focus on the large angular scales. So how do we model the CIB anisotropies on linear scales? Uh, as a lot of us know probably that on linear scales, the physics is a bit simpler and any, observ any observable which emit emits light, we can basically model it as the power spectrum, it's proportional to the bias square of that observable times the, ma the ma matter power spectrum. And then you weigh it by some emiss emissivity of your tracer. So in this case, it's the CIB at, frequen uh, at, at the frequencies for which you are calculating the auto or cross power spectrum. And this, uh, galaxy emissivity term is somehow proportional to something called rho SFR, which is the star formation rate density history of the universe. 
So it, it talks about the star formation history of the universe at different redshifts. And then, of course, there is the term of galaxy clustering, how the galaxies are, how these CIB galaxies are clustered uh, um, at different redshifts. So you can just imagine from this equation that if somehow uh, we can connect the measurements with, with, the, with this model, with this theory, we could potentially constrain, put constraints on the on the clust galaxy clustering term, how the galaxies are clustered, and the galaxy emissivity, which in turn can tell us about the star formation history of the universe. And that is exactly our first result here, where we show uh, the constraints on the star uh, SF, uh, this row SFR, which is the SF, which is also called the SFRD star formation rate density of the universe, which tells you how many stars form in a given year within a given cosmological volume at different redshifts. So x-axis is the redshift here. Uh, and these different, the, the I'm basically showing the one sigma and two sigma contours, which we get uh, by fitting our model to the power spectra along with some other uh, other observables. Uh, and, the, and, and these colored points here, they basically show SFRD measurements from extra from from galaxy surveys just by observing galaxies in a certain region of sky you can determine the sfrd at different redshifts and that's what these are showing and our results are consistent with those and then you will also see that there are these black points which fall well below the uh, well below our curve at low redshift but start getting close to the curve at redshifts four and higher but these black black points represent is the unobscured SFRD. So the SFRD, which is measured through UV uh, wavelengths rather than the infrared wavelengths. And what this says is, is this is kind of known, this result is uh, known, uh, very well known, that at low redshifts, the a lot of UV radiation gets absorbed by the galaxy, uh, dust in the galaxies, and that's why the SFRD is measured through these infrared wavelengths. But as you go on higher redshifts, the SFRD, which we can measure through the UV uh, UV wavelengths, becomes uh, almost equal to the infrared uh, infrared SFRD, and at even higher uh, redshifts, it is supposed to dominate over uh, over the infrared uh, measurements. So this this is also a nice result that at red, from redshift four and higher, when we calc when we talk about this star formation history of the universe we should talk about both the infrared as well as the uv contributions we should con uh, we should not neglect the uh, uv contribution that's one of the results then i had told you that we could not, it's not just the emissivity term which you can constrain but also the galaxy clustering uh, and what 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 can that galaxy clustering tell you so the the b effective the galaxy clustering term is a function of halo mass and redshift and we can invert this equation and write the halo mass as a function of B effective and, and the redshift. And that's exactly what this plot does. And there are lots of things happening in this plot. I, I, I kind of like this plot. So uh, let me explain what, what are the different things happening here. So these uh, dashed curves, slanted curves, they are basically showing the trajectories of how dark matter halos grow over time through accreting more and more matter. So for example, some halo at redshift four had a mass of let's say 10 to the power 11 solar masses. So which it grows over time and at redshift zero, it has a mass of approximately 10 to the power 12 solar masses. So that's what these lines are showing. And then again, we show one and two sigma contours of the typical dark host dark matter halos. Their, uh, the typical mass of the host dark matter halos, which are hosting these uh, star, dusty star forming galaxies. And as you can see, it's more or less constant at all these redshifts. And there are different regimes here. So for example, uh, he, here is also a fun part now. At, if you look at redshift 2.5 and higher, you'll see that the, the halos which were hosting the CIB type of galaxies, now they have grown they, they have grown in the, in the uh, over, over the or this redshift range and now they have they are the clusters which we observe in the in the current universe so progenitors of clusters were hosting uh, hosting star formation at redshift 2.5 and higher similarly progenitors of groups which we observe were hosting the C, the, the, the star forming galaxies between let's say redshift almost 0.3 to 2.5 and at in really local universe or let's let's end at shift 0.3 uh dark matter halos 
which look like our milky way uh, milky way hello they ho host the typical uh, they are the typical star forming hosting uh, galaxies uh, sorry they are the typical star forming galaxy host now uh, in, in the local universe so these are the kinds of fun things you can understand and very important things which you can understand using the cosmic uh, infrared background and this is only using the linear uh, linear part of the signal uh, now this was just the cib but as I, as i told you cib traces the large scale structure and there are other tracers of the large scale structure for example galaxies galaxies perform the same job some any kind of galaxies uh, it is a tracer of the large scale structure so we expect there to be some correlation between the cib and galaxy so i'm going to tell you very briefly uh, in a couple of slides about this recent paper we put out on archive which performs the cib cross galaxy correlation and the kind of uh, interesting things we can do with that so i just want to show you what we did in this paper very briefly so we cross correlated the cib map uh, new cib maps from planck with the galaxies in the kids survey uh, kilo degree sky survey which is uh, its its main purpose is the uh, doing the weak lensing studies but it overlap it has significant overlap uh, with, with the with the uh, with the planck cib uh the, the the latest planck cib maps and as i said to you we expect there to be this cross correlation because there are traces of large scale structure and indeed we detect this cross correlation at more than 40 sigma so that's what uh, we do and i just want to show you one result uh coming out of this study where again i'm showing you the row sfr which is the sfrd at, at different redshifts and uh which and correspondingly the look back time uh, in giga years on, on on the x axis and what we are so the, the these uh, these colored contours are basically the co colored bands are showing our measurements and what these different uh, curves are showing is the sfrd predictions coming from either simulations or different semi analytical models it's one of the one of the major challenges uh, currently uh, for us to understand this complex baryon baryonic physics which happens inside of the galaxies uh, and in the matter surrounding them and we the, the on linear scales the dark matter physics is fairly straightforward we can model it very well through the n body simulations but things get very tricky when we go to these small scales and understanding this complex physics is kind of uh, is, is is a big challenge and and th that's why we have different recipe different simulations or different models with different recipes of, for the star formation the different quenching processes happening in the galaxies or clusters etc and that's why it's important to compare these simulations or mo models against the measurements which you get from something like cosmic infrared background uh, which we do here and what can what kind of conclusions can you draw from here so for example you can see look at this l galaxies which is a uh, which is a, a semi analytical model you can see although it agrees well with our predictions for the sfrd at low redshifts it differs uh, from from the sfrd our sfrd predictions at high at at at, at, this, at slightly higher redshifts and similarly if you look look at galform uh, sams again you will see that it over predicts the sfrd at low redshifts compared to us so based based on this you can you, you can slightly make some inferences about uh, whether if there is a lot of feedback in in these models at low redshifts or uh, sorry uh, less feedback or more star formation than than expected or if there is a lot of feedback at high redshifts things like that so and as the data becomes more and better and better more sensitive we will have even better understanding of these things so we will be able to somehow tune and calibrate our simulations uh, to such observables so this was uh, our interesting result which came out just uh, just last week and now i want to switch the topics slightly i covered some part of the astrophysics and now i want to talk about some cosmological results which we can do with the cosmic infrared background uh, this paper should be out either next week most probably next week or 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 if not then early next week uh, next to next week and this work i have done in collaboration with uh, simone ferraro and emmanuel shan at berkeley and we where we discuss about the probability the, the prospects of detecting 
the Doppler emission, the, the, the CIB emission, which is Doppler boosted. Now, what, what, do, what do I mean by that again? So uh, let's see. Let's imagine there is this galaxy which is contributing to the cosmic infrared background. Excuse me. And as we know, there are these, in the universe, there are these large scale dark matter, uh, large scale bulk flows of the matter, matter distribution. And if the, and the galaxies are caught in this bulk flow. So these galaxies can have some peculiar velocity with respect to us along our line of sight. And if that happens, uh, you know, what, what are the consequences uh, of that? So when this galaxy emits some radiation in its rest frame at some particular frequency, normally we would observe it at, it at some different frequency due to the cosmological expansion. But now, apart from this cosmological expansion, there is also the, the peculiar velocity of, the, of, of, of these galaxies, the galaxy because it is caught in this bulk, bulk fluid motion. And that's why there, it's, its emission is going to be Doppler boosted based on, based on if the galaxy is coming towards us or going away from us. And that is what, this, that is what we mean by the Doppler boosted CIB photons. And what we found out was this fractional change in the, in the specific intensity coming from a given galaxy due to, uh, due to this Doppler boosting comes out to be in this very simple form, beta times three minus alpha, where beta is the relativistic velocity V or C, where C is the speed of light, and alpha is basically dependent on the, the specific intensity as a function of the observed, uh, uh, observed frequency. Uh, and this alpha, we can, uh, we, uh, we can see here, it also slightly depends on the kind of template you assume for your CIB, CIB type of galaxies. So in the past, a lot of people have assumed CIB as a mod modified black body emitter, that CIB, the, the dust, in this, uh, dust in these galaxies follows a mo modified black body for, 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 uh, uh, for, for, for its specific uh, intensity. Then uh, if you assume that, you get these dashed curves. If you assume some templates uh, which are calibrated on some observations, then you can get something like this, which I show here in, in curves. So there are these minor differences, but more or less you can see that we have, uh, we, have, uh, we have an anchor in this alpha. We can measure this very well. And then we have this beta, and that's why this, this, uh, this allows us to calculate this delta i over i. All right. And what, what, are the, what are the prospects for the detectability of this signal to noise ratio? Uh, and when I say signal to noise, here I'm talking about cross correlation between this delta i, which is coming only from because of the Doppler effect, uh, and this q, something called q gamma, which is the velocity weighted density field, basically the, the Doppler effect, uh, the, the, the velocity field and, and the Doppler effect cross correlation. And it seems like with Planck, it would be slightly tricky to detect uh, the, uh, this signal, even with, uh, uh, with DESI. Maybe DESI LRG would slightly, maybe barely detect this signal. If you have something like LSST, uh, maybe it would be detected a bit better with Planck. But if, with, with CCAT prime experiment, uh, they, the chances of detecting this uh, the signal to noise uh, for, for, for a signal, uh, for, for a uh, signal like this, uh, a cross correlation like this, should be should be very high, uh, and that that's one of the results, and that's one of the uh, uh, pro, uh, that's one of the important thing and uh, things for in in terms of cosmology, and why why do I say so? And that's where that's where this uh, that's where I would like to explain uh, what I mean by that. So now let's let's look at this equation carefully again. Delta i or i is equal to beta times three minus alpha. Now we can rewrite this equation such that this is an estimator for beta, uh, where beta is the velocity field as I had told you, V or C. So we can rewrite this equation uh, as an estimator for beta. And then if we can estimate this large scale velocity flows, we, it, is, it is well established now that velocity fields can constrain parameters like FNL, the pr primordial non-Gaussianity, much much better than use uh, than what we can do using just the galaxy uh, the just the density fields. So velocity fields can constrain uh, FNL much better than the density fields, 
and also other parameters like growth rate um, uh, or some other cosmological parameters. This has been well established and that's why uh, for the up upcoming CMB experiments like um, Simon's Observatory and CMBS4, measuring something called the KSZ, kinematic sinusoidal Deutsch effect, which I'll briefly explain later on what that is. Measuring this effect is kind of important because it is proportional to this beta factor. But the problem in the KSZ field is that KSZ has something called this optical depth degeneracy. So KSZ is proportional to something called tau, which is the optical depth times beta. And unfortunately, they can both not be determined at the same time. Uh, and that's why we have this degeneracy. But here for us, we won't have such a problem because everything in this equation is measurable or calibratable. And that's why we won't have this degeneracy problem. We will be directly, we will be able to directly measure this beta, uh, uh, beta field. And uh, it would be, it, it could be a great pro probe for the cos uh, cosmological, uh, different cosmological parameters. And of course, now this would be a new source of foreground uh, in, in the CMB studies, which was not considered before, but uh, that's that's not what I want to discuss currently due to lack of, lack of time. And I'm going to move on. Uh, and I'm going to briefly tell you about one more application in the field of cosmology for uh, for the cosmic infrared background. So I covered two cosmo astrophysical uses, uh, one, one cosmological result. I, I want to share one more cosmological result with you, what we can do with the CIB. And this is in conjunction with the cosmic micro background and its anisotropies. So this is, I, I'm sure a lot of you have already seen this map, beautiful CMB map from, from the Planck Consortium. And um, what, what you can see here is like, there are these small, small scale anisotropies on, on, this, on, on this map. And what you can do is you can take this map and calculate its power spectrum. So this, and the power spectrum looks like this. This has been very well measured and you can basically explain this power spectrum with just six parameters to a really high accuracy, uh, our famous Lambda CDM model. Now, out of this, uh, this uh, out, out of this power spectrum, I, I, I wanna focus on a really large angular scale CMB anisotropies, and particularly the, something called the ISW, integrated Saxwell wavelength. Uh, it's possible that uh, some of you don't really know what exactly ISW is. So I just want to briefly mention what ISW is. Let's imagine a universe where I'm for now neglecting the cosmological expansion and the, it's a flat universe without dark energy. So no dark energy and no cosmological exp expansion. And there is CMB and we are here. So a CMB photon, let's say tra is traveling towards us and on the way towards us, it falls into a potential well of a cluster. So there is a massive cluster which has like, uh, gra like huge gravity and that's why it has a potential well. So as the photon enters this potential well, it gains some energy. And then uh, to, to get out of this potential well, it has to give up that energy. So, and in that case, what happens is the energy it gained on the way in is equal to the energy it loses on the way out. And we observe no change in the photon. Now let's see, a flat universe with the dark energy. And now I'm, I'm not neglecting the cosmic expansion anymore. And I'll tell you what, what its effect is. Now, let's see. Now there is a photon. Now we are in the universe with the dark energy and, uh, we, uh, and the cosmological expansion. Now there is a so photon coming from the CMB towards us, uh, but it does not fall into a potential well on the way towards us, right? So it, it continues from the CMB and comes directly to us. So what happens is it starts, it gets cosmologically uh, redshifted because of the expansion, and then we see it at some particular wavelength. Now there is another photon, which on the way towards us falls into a potential well in the same universe. Then uh, when it falls, it gains some potential energy. Uh, it, 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 ga it gains some energy. And then by the time, by the time it gets out, it, it lose, uh, so in order to get out, again, it has to lose some energy, but what happens in this universe is because of the dark energy, by the time photon comes out, enters and uh, goes out, the potential well has expanded slightly. And, that, and that's why the photon does not have to lose all the energy, which, is, which it gained on the way in. And that's why if you compare these two photons, you will see that this photon is slightly hotter than the, than the first photon. And that is nothing but the integrated Saxwell effect. It, 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 it's a contrast between photons coming through the clusters and uh, 
uh, photons which are not coming, uh, which don't fall into these clusters. And as I said to you, this effect shows up on really large angular scales in the CMB power spectrum. So basically, here uh, there, with the with with the ISW effect included, you get the red curve, and without the ISW, you have this black curve. Now, uh, this effect, of course, you can see it's very small, and unfortunately, it's within the cosmic variance limit. To it's a limit to uh, to to the width uh, to which you you cannot make better measurements of the power spectrum within. Uh, than than this limit so unfortunately using the cmb power spectrum alone it's not possible to detect this isw effect so we come up with different techniques like we cross correlate the cmb power spectrum with large scale structure tracers and using this we increase the signal to noise ratio and using this technique the isw effect has been measured with snr going up to four even so uh and that's what we do exactly here. As I told you before, CIB is a tracer of large scale structure. So we cross correlate CIB with the CMB and we measure the ISW and which in a way is a measurement of the dark energy in a flat universe. And we show that ISW, the dark energy detected in this way could potentially constrain something called W, which is the equation of state of the dark uh, of the dark energy if we assume that dark energy is a fluid then it's basically the ratio between the the, the pressure and the um, and the density of the fluid uh, so you could constrain this much better than 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 our latest constraints which we have on, have on w and also there are you could put put really strong constraints on on the on the growth of growth of the structure or some other cosmological parameters and we wanted to check this on the actual data. So we took the, re, the, the best existing CIB maps and the CMB maps, and we performed this cross correlation. This is what we found. And when we performed the null test, unfortunately, what we found that we could not claim a detection, the signal at the current level is still consistent with zero. So what we found out was uh, the current CIB maps are not big enough. So we need larger sky fraction and we need better dust cleaning. When I say dust here, it means the dust within our own galaxy, the Milky Way dust. So what, what we realized from here was on large angular scales, CIB and CMB, they work really well together and they are, they are, they are, they are a really good cosmological probe. But what happens on the small angular scales? So it, uh, the situation is a bit tricky. It's like a standoff. So as I said to you before, on larger angular scales, galactic dust is really harmful to the cosmic infrared background. And then, and that's exactly what CIB does to the CMB on small angular scales. Uh, and let me show you how that works through this plot. So I'm sh again showing you the CMB power spectrum on this on the very small scales. You will observe that the scale, the multipoles start from 2000 and higher. So all those beautiful acoustic peaks, they basically lie on the left-hand side of these plots. And this is for different frequencies, auto and cross spectra. Um, and this is measured by the SPT data. Uh, and as you can see, the, these, are, these are the measurements, but there are a lot of other curves. So there is the CIB, then there is something called TSZ, then there is the, the, there is the radio, and we also have this the dashed blue curve, which is what I would like to focus on right now. And that is nothing but the kinematic sinusoidal Deutsch effect. Uh, and just imagine you want to measure this blue dashed line. Then in this case, the CIB, which overwhelms this blue, blue dashed line or at all the frequencies, it's kind of a nuisance. So CIB is the bad person here. Now, before, before we proceed, I want to I, I, I wanna, I wanna answer if someone thinks, why should we measure this small signal? So why should we measure this uh, KSG signal? So first of all, let's see what is the sinusoidal Deutsch effect. Very briefly, if a CMB photon coming towards us, if it, if it goes into, a, uh, if it interacts with the highly energetic free electrons within the galaxy clusters, these electrons can inverse Compton scatter the CMB photons, and which can distort the, the perfect black body spectrum, or, uh, the spectrum of the CMB. And this is the thermal sinusoidal Deutsch effect. But sometimes what happens is apart from this thermal effect, we also have this the whole gas as a bulk motion. And again, with bulk motions, as we saw before, there is a Doppler component. 
So there is a Doppler component to this scattering, and that is the kinematics of nasal edge effect. Uh, so as you can see, the ESG affects the CMB, distorts the CMB black body uh, spectrum in this way, and the KZ affects the black body spectrum this way. As you, and as also as you can see, KZ is much smaller than the TSG. Uh, and also now it's clear the TSG and KZ trace the clusters of galaxies. Right, so why do we want to measure this? Uh, and this brings me back to this period of reionization. Uh, the KZ basically, KZ ha has two contributions. One is called the homogeneous KZ and the other one is called the patchy KZ. And the homogeneous KZ, KZ occurs after the reionization is finished and after the universe is completely reionized, re so in low redshift universe. But the patchy KZ happens when the reionization is going on. And that's why if we are able to measure the KZ power spectrum, we can put constraints on the patchy component of the, of the KZ. And that in turn can tell us how, like when did the reionization happen? How did it proceed and how long it lasted? And that's why we wanna measure this KZ power spectrum. And that brings me uh, to this, uh, this project we have going on currently, which is measuring the KZ power spectrum from the CMB data. And there is one tweak which we are doing. We are converting the CIB from bad to good. And this is being carried out in collaboration with Matthew Tristram and Xavier Garrido in Paris and Guillain Lagache in Marseille. So uh, once again, this is the dashed blue line is the signal we are trying to measure, which as you can see is much, much smaller than all the other foregrounds, especially the cosmic infrared background, which, is, which, which are the orange curves. And not just that, the KSZ is also unfortunately, the KZ power spectrum is also unfortunately degenerate with, with these other foregrounds, which is to be expected. So KSZ is degenerate with the thermal signal dash power spectrum and also with the TSZ CIB correlation. Now one might wonder why are TSZ and CIB correlated? Uh, where TSZ again is the thermal component of the signal dash effect. And as I said to you before, TSZ is tracing the galaxy clusters and galaxy clusters are tracers again of the large scale structure. And CIB is one more tracer of the large scale structure. So we expect there to be some correlation within TSZ and CIB. And unfortunately, even this uh, correlation is degenerate with, with the, it's correlated with the KZ measurements. So what that means is as the data quality keeps on getting better. So right now we have AG, advanced AG, we have SPT data, and then that's, th these are already giving really amazing measurements at smaller angular scales, which is just gonna get even better with SO and CMBS4. So data is getting better. So we need to get a better control on the models of these different foregrounds to, to use this data and make in correct inferences about these foregrounds to get better constraints and reliable constraints, unbiased constraints on the KSZ power spectrum. And what, what is currently being done is the following. As I told you, in normally uh, a lot of times, these foregrounds are seen as, as the word itself says you, a foreground. So it's a nuisance parameter to our signal. So normally for, for all these different foregrounds, we either fit a power law uh, or a best fit template for, for CIB, TSZ, and their cross correlation. And so what we do is we assume a, a, some, some kind of power law or a best fit template, and we, we fit for one amplitude across all the different frequency channels. This is definitely not good for something like CIB because we know CIB at different frequency is slightly different and it's not perfectly correlated. All different frequency channels are not perfectly correlated. So this is not a good assumption. And also sometimes there are inconsistencies. So when in the template approaches, you take one template for the CIB, you take another template for the TSZ, and then you have third template for CIB cross TSZ. Ideally, you would want the templates which are used for CIB and TSZ to be the ones which go into the CIB and TSZ cross correlation template. But sometimes that's not the case. So there are these inconsistencies. And these approaches sometimes also assume that these foregrounds are not explicitly dependent on the cosmology of the universe. That if the cosmology were different, probably they assume that the CIB, TSZ, they would all look more or less the same, which is of course not true. So there is a huge scope of improvement in this, in, in this part. And that's what we want to do, what we need to do. That we need to convert this bad to good instead of looking at them 
add some foregrounds and that's why fitting for a power law or a template we need physically motivated hello model for these foregrounds like cib and psg and with these uh, hello models we should uh, make a consistent cib tsg cross correlation model we should consider the cosmology dependence explicitly for this foreground and now that we have this amazing data at all the wavelengths uh, uh, different frequencies and different scales like from planck spt and act for cmb and then again herschel and planck hfi for cib we should be able to use all these data together and perform a multi frequency multi scale analysis and that's what that's what we uh, we are doing here and for that the first thing we need a physically motivated hello model for the cib and now you might wonder there are hello models of the cib why do we want something new so uh, so the previous hello models of the cib for example the first one of, one of the very first ones which come from comes from shang et al it assumes some luminosity to hello mass relation for this uh, for, for the dark matter halos hosting the cib type of galaxies with which has really high number of parameters so this is an empirical relation with really high number of parameters uh, which fits the CI, cib power spectra well but their results when they predict the excuse me for example the star formation history of the universe the results are not really consistent with the galaxy measurement uh, the sfrd measured with galaxies so there are these inconsistencies so we need a model which is simpler not, does not have really high number of parameters but also it it is able to consistently fit for sfrd data as well and that's why we we propose this new model which starts from very basic principles of basically accretion on the dark matter hello so as i told you before dark matter halos grow over time by accreting more and more matter some of this matter is in the form of baryons and that's why we have this baryonic accretion rate that baryons are getting accreted onto these dark matter halos and some of these baryons are going to get converted into stars that's what we assume here and once you have this baryonic accretion rate and once you have this uh, efficiency of converting these baryons into stars you can calculate the star formation rate as a function of halo mass at, at a given redshift and once you have uh, uh, so so this gives this procedure gives you how to calculate sfr as a function of halo mass and redshift and we, this this has three simple parameters so the the amplitude of this log normal the width of this log normal the uh, the mass at which this maximum efficiency of converting baryons into stars occurs and then these are the three parameters and then we also include one extra parameter which is which we call the width uh, which which changes the width of this log normal why do we do that because there has been uh, there has been th there have been studies which have shown that really massive halos at low redshift have very inefficient star formation due to different uh, feedback processes but at at the uh, but on the contrary on the high redshift they can still have some star formation so that's why we wanted to keep this width of the log normal flexible uh, to allow it to vary with the redshift so that's our fourth parameter and so from these four parameters you can determine the sfr once you have the sfr you can determine something called the specific emissivity for a given halo and that in turn allows you to calculate uh, the cib power spectra so this is our very simple uh, model with just four parameters uh which fits uh, the both the planck and herschel data uh more or less and then it's also consistent with the uh, with the external galaxy survey sfrd uh, measurements so which is which is a good news so what we are doing right now is uh, so we have these physically motivated mo uh, hello models for cib and also tsg Uh, i'm not going to talk about the tsd hello model here because uh, that's uh, that that just something uh, which is extra and we can talk about it some other time uh, but once we have these hello models we can consistently model the cib tsd correlation within this uh, within the same formalism we have put this in the something called the hillipop likelihood which has been used for the planck analysis in the past and we have combined the different data sets as i had mentioned to you before planck spt and act for the cmb and herschel and planck data for the cib and we are using something called a, a toolbox called camel to per perform a monte carlo analysis of all these data uh, we are done replacing the old templates with these hello models uh, we are considering the cosmology dependence of the foregrounds at every step 
and we are currently in the process of adding the Herschel likelihood uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, camel, camel toolbox. And what are, not, what are our next steps? We want to perform this MCMC, get the robust constraints on the KZ power spectrum, which hopefully are unbiased. Uh, in turn, put constraints on the reionization parameters, different uh, history of the reionization history parameters. And also, now because we are not treating this as a foreground, we are treating it as a signal, we have the star formation history constraints from this beautiful CMB data, which goes to really small angular scales. And that will also in turn allow us to put constraints on dark matter hello to baryon connection at all these different redshifts. So that's what we are going to do. Uh, so, all right. So uh, I just have a couple of more slides. I think uh, if I still have time, I would like to talk about them. Just, there are just two, three more slides. Is that okay? Yeah, we have like uh, two, three minutes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, and this, uh, this this project is about uh, line intensity mapping field, where especially the C, lines like C2, which fall in this infrared regime, where again, CIB acts like, like a bad person. Uh, and this project is being led by an under, undergraduate student at NYU, uh, uh, Zilu and, uh, and Anthony Pullen. So uh, very briefly, for those of you who don't know what line intensity mapping is, for uh, the, uh, like our normal galaxy surveys, we are able to detect, we can point our telescope in a given part of the sky and we can detect brightest of the galaxies easily. If you point the telescope for even longer time, you can probably detect some more galaxies here and there, but you will miss out on a lot of faint galaxy emission. So what line intensity mapping does, it says like, I don't wanna detect these galaxies individually, but what I, would, what I care about is getting the cumulative emission from like getting all the emission from the from all the sources even in a given patch of the sky so all the galaxies photons coming from all the galaxies so i cannot resolve the galaxies individually but i i get all the uh, i collect all the photons coming from them so line intensity mapping basically measures aggregate in intensity in this large very large 2d pixels and it, it does that in multiple frequency beams so you also have redshift information now when you perform this for something this line intensity mapping for uh, for something like a C2 line, which falls in this infrared regime, what you can do is you you will you will eventually have a map like this uh, in in the infrared part uh, in the infrared, and you can take its power spectrum, and if you put plot that power spectrum against the k parallel modes, which are the line of sight modes along the along your line of sight, you will see that the lowest k parallel modes the longest modes are completely dominated by this correlated continuum, which in this case is the cosmic infrared background. And so if, if it is the C2 signal you are after, then you have what you have to do is one of the one of the approaches which we think is going to be very helpful is we will have to discard all the data on these large angular scales. We will have to throw away this data because it's completely dominated by the CIB and just use this remaining part of the uh, power spectrum to make our analysis. Now, what we are doing in this uh, current project is we say, what if instead of throwing this part away, what if we, if we can model this signal, which is kind of tricky because CIV is an integrated emission. So you cannot really calculate uh, com effects coming from different K parallel modes, but we can in principle model that. And that's what we are doing here. We are modeling this uh, this signal, uh, this co CIB continuum as a function of K parallel mode. Uh, we, uh, also, uh, also the C2 uh, signal as a function of K parallel uh, uh, modes. And then instead of throwing away this information, we are going to combine all that information together. And this probably, we have some pre preliminary results, but unfortunately I cannot show them today, but we see that we have much better constraints on the star formation history if we include this information. Uh, rather than if we don't. So that's that's another way you can convert something which is bad to something which is good. So like, uh, rather than throwing away the information, why not use it, make use of our previous uh, like uh, information and, and put better constraints on the uh, on the history of the universe. And that that basically brings me to the conclusion uh, uh, of this of this of this talk. Basically, I, I hope I have shown you like CIB is a powerful 
tool for doing both astrophysics as well as cosmology. Uh, at times, it is indeed an overwhelming source of noise or bias to other cosmological signals. But because we have, we have over the last few uh, few years, we have had much better measurements of the CIB itself. We can use this as an opportunity to use it as a signal and understand different parts of the universe in a better way. And this is just going to keep on getting better and better, as I told you. There is going to be CCAT prime and some other experiments uh, like CMB experiments, which are going to measure CIB, CMB and CIB at different frequencies uh, at very good angular resolutions. Of course, there are many other avenues where CIB uh, is still very useful, basically delensing of the CMB to detect the B modes or CIB TSG cross correlation to understand how the gas in the galaxy cluster evolves, how the stars form in galaxy clusters, or even the lensing of the CIB to talk about the higher redshift universe, or uh, CIB as a tracer of the large scale structure to probe the kinematics and Hazard H effect through something called the projected field estimators. And there are many other applications. Uh, but I hope I have put my point across by now. And, uh, and with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you. Great, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, we have time for a few questions, if people have them. Um, I have one while other people think about theirs. Um, so you mentioned that you constructed this, this uh, HOD model, basically a full parameter um, model to, to do this analysis. Right. And you mentioned that the, I think it was the Shang 2012 work used a much more complicated parameterization. Right. Um, I mean, I can understand the, the kind of desire to have a simpler model, but, but was that Shang model, it was, if I remember correctly, it was sort of motivated by, by galaxy models, which actually predicted a pretty complicated um, uh, kind of relation. Is that, is that right? Uh, I, so, so it depends. So the Shang, Shang et al. model actually goes along the same lines for the regular HOD models in the, in the Hello model framework. But when it, when, it, when it does this luminosity to hello mass relation, what it assumes is it is, assumes some very simple things. That is, it assumes that this relation has a redshift evolution. So luminosity is proportional to one plus Z to the power alpha, so a power law. Then it assumes that it has some, uh, some, fre uh, some frequency evolution that is basically the SEDs of different CIB galaxies. And they assume like a modified black body. And then they assume that this dust within the galaxy evolves again with redshift. So one more power law. And then they multiply all these power laws. And that's basically the luminosity to halo mass relation with some normalization factor, of course. Uh, so it is, and, and after, after once they have this luminosity to halo mass relation, they put it in the normal HOD framework, which was developed by Shet and Kure and others. Uh, and then they proceed with the calculating the power spectra. So, like it, it's not completely unrealistic, but again, there are too many number of parameters, so you are never really sure uh, about the good fit, uh, about the goodness of the fit, and also this is the one of the major issues, like SFRD measurements. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. That, that clarifies it for me. Um, do we have any other questions? not, I'm not seeing any. So in that case, let's uh, thank Abhishek again. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Abhishek. It was really nice, really interesting stuff. So, thanks. Dan. Yeah. Good. Well, um, yeah, thanks again. And uh, like I said, definitely once you're on this side of the country, um, let me know and we should have you come down and visit. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you.